Hello, my name is Mike Crump. I am stood outside a £545 million facility opened in Birmingham in 2010, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Behind me is the mental health unit of that hospital. I am DC, former DC 9165 Crump of the West Midlands Police Force. I spent most of my time in the police force as a murder investigator until in 2006 I experienced a major nervous breakdown, followed by two or three years of struggle with mental illness. This is the Shared Voices Mental Health Heritage Project funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. We will be taking you on a journey to a study of the heritage of the treatment of mental health in Birmingham from the time of the asylums until the present and studying themes that are relevant to that subject area. In 1845 an Act of Parliament required boroughs across the country to open asylums. On the 10th of November 1845 Birmingham's first lunatic committee sat behind me in Birmingham's town hall. In 1850 Birmingham's first asylum was opened at Winston Green All Saints Asylum which provided spaces for 300 patients at the cost of 14 shillings a week. I think the 18th century was really a time of considerable transition. It, it's been identified as the era when the perception of, of, of people with, mad people as they were referred to, changed really for, from them being seen as and dealt with as if they were really sort of like wild animals or brutes that needed to be tamed. Uh, and, the, and during the course of the century the, 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 the perception changed really that they were, they were in effect people who had lost their reason and therefore one should try one's best to get to restore their reason. I think one has to go back a little bit because the first legislation for establishing county lunatic asylums was actually in 1808 um, and that was permissive legislation which uh, enabled county magistrates to establish uh, a lunatic asylum for, for, for paupers either on their own or in conjunction with charitable bodies whereby they would also provide for charity patients. So, so that happened in, in some counties. So under that legislation, um, a number of counties did provide uh, asylums. The, the nearest locally was Stafford. Uh, the Staffordshire Asylum opened in 1818 uh, in Stafford. By the late 1820s, they had taken over the contract with Birmingham for Birmingham Poor Lunatics. Uh, so the, the ones that, most of the ones that were previously in Droitwich were moved to Stafford and new admissions then went to Stafford. It wasn't until 1845 that legislation was passed to require county authorities and significantly borough authorities to provide a lunatic asylum. Um, and Birmingham being, a, in effect, a county borough, uh, was one of those that f came under the new legislation. And in fact, Birmingham was the first borough in the country to establish uh, a borough lunatic asylum. It started in All Saints Hospital and eventually they got a, um, some premises where patients could go during the day and then back to the hospital at night. There were grounds, very pleasant grounds to walk in and uh, people knew each other and it was, just, it was like a village really. The wards were not subdivided at all but they were, they were uh, overcrowded as well so that um, there were just rows of beds down each side. In fact, sometimes when there was a shortage of beds, the, the beds were pushed so close together the patients had to climb in over the end. So we set about uh, reducing the number of patients on, on the wards and giving them more space. In the end, it, it was possible to pr put curtains around bed beds so people had a degree of privacy and a locker. <laughs> 
There was no central heating. Um, the place needed rewiring. Um, the walls needed plastering. There was a, there was a n large number of uh, structural alterations that needed to be done. I was called up late one night to the, one of the long-stay wards in All Saints by one of the nurses. And it was an elderly ward. There were older patients there, um, 65 plus, you know. And I went into the ward and there were beds lined along, perhaps 20 beds in this one big room. And a rat ran over the bed. I mean, it was, it was shocking. You know, that was the way, that, that was the way people uh, people lived. You know, having said that, um, uh, given the fact that there wasn't support in the community, uh, all things are relative. Compared to that, people were well fed, they had activities, they were look looked after, and in some ways, things were better. As well as placing its poor lunatics uh, out in Stafford, um, Birmingham uh, had a, quite a substantial section of the workhouse, the Birmingham workhouse set aside for lunatics and so did the uh, so did Aston as well. So both Birmingham and Aston workhouses contained specific sections within the workhouse for, for, for pauper lunatics and again uh, the the Birmingham Board of Guardians and the Aston Board of Guardians entered into a contract with the proprietor of Duddeston Hall uh, to send their their lunatics, or their most disturbed lunatics there, because the ones who were fairly quiet and manageable stayed in the workhouse because that was cheaper. But the ones who, who, who were violent or, or more disturbed and challenging would be sent to Duddeston or, or another private asylum. Well, I suppose it caused institutionalisation, that's the, that's the word that was used. And, and you get the same thing, whether it's a monastery or, a, or an army, uh, uh, people become institutionalised. They go follow the same routine all the time and everything's provided and uh, it's a nice life. But it takes away your um, individuality. The, the word that comes to me is very impoverished lives. I mean, literally didn't have much money. There was quite a lot of love in the staff, quite a lot of caring. I mean, we were criticised now by many people as being very paternalistic, you know. The recovery rates were quite good. At least a half of, of the people ad ad admitted would, would be discharged within a few months or a year, often higher proportions than that. Certainly people with what we now call bipolar disorder uh, w would be in and out of the asylum. They may have fairly short spells in, in, in the asylum, get better, go out, go back to work, whatever, get readmitted and, and so on and so on. So it, it certainly wasn't the case that once you were in, you, you were stuck there for life. One of the problems with, with the county asylums and the borough asylums was that it didn't take very long before they became full up uh, because of growing numbers of admissions and, and, and because some people weren't being discharged, that, that, that there'd be an accumulating number of long-term patients. So the asylums would become overcrowded, then they would have to build on uh, extra floors or extra wings and make all sorts of adjustments to the building so as to squeeze more patients in, which would lead to, be, to the asylums becoming bigger and bigger. Eventually a time would come when that, that was, it was not practical to make it any bigger. So then uh, you would find a second or even a third asylum being built. So the second asylum in Birmingham was uh, the one at Rubery which opened, I can't remember exactly, I think it was uh, in the late 1870s or thereabouts. Uh, and then later on you had the third asylum at Hollymore which opened in I think 1905 or 6. So that's what happened, that they, they, they would have to gradually build others and then after Hollymore in the 20th century you had, you had other ones came later. In the very old days, I mean I'm talking before the 70s, you know, if you had a diagnosis of schizophrenia 
it was kind of assumed that means you stay in hospital. I mean the thought that if one had a very severe physical, if one became a paraplegic, so one lost the use of one's legs, that one should stay in hospital for the rest of one's life would have been crazy. And even, you know, years ago no one would have thought that. But some other thought was because when so you couldn't do certain things in life, that your mind in certain ways didn't work or at certain times didn't work and you had trouble working things out, that your whole life should then be catered for you in an in institution, was really, I think, a, although it wasn't explicit, it was implicit in what happened. The whole ethos behind the asylum was totally different to the ethos behind the workhouse. The asylum was uh, intended to be a place where people were enabled to get better, recover and return to the community. Certainly, in terms of the standards of the time, and, and, and you know, thinking of, you know of working class people in, in industrial Birmingham, the standards in, in the asylum were very high. It was very comfortable. Uh, most people would have individual rooms. Obviously, they would have a bed and bedding. Uh, they would get reasonable meals, and uh, so to, to that extent, it was really quite comfortable. After the 1845. Act that, that required the establishment of county asylums or, or borough asylums. Whilst they, they were planning the, the building of, of what became All Saints, within the workhouse they improved the arrangements for, for, for the, the pauper lunatics, uh, established much more specific wards for them, even more so than had been the case before. And one of the workhouse surgeons, Thomas Green, he in effect took over sole responsibility for the lunatics in the workhouse. He and established systems very much as, as would have been the case in an asylum. So he, he, he set up um, case, case records um, and everything was recorded and, and there was detailed histories provided of each patient. Um, then ongoing records of their treatment and so on. And, of course, Green went on to become the first superintendent of the Birmingham Borough Asylum. So he, in effect, had this period of preparation before the asylum opened. And uh, I think it's probably more than likely that it, it, was, it was all prearranged that he would be the superintendent. So this was sort of like his apprenticeship. And Dr. Green uh, was medical superintendent from 1850 until his death in 1883. Uh, he was a man who, from his writings, was uh, very kind, compassionate, and conscientious. Uh, much of his care was uh, built around the belief in the work ethic, and he um, prided himself on the fact that all of the people who were treated in the hospital were employed in some capacity or another. Systems that worked well when an asylum had two or three hundred patients didn't really work so well when they were getting towards a thousand patients because in effect the whole thing became much more impersonal that where maybe in the early days the medical superintendent would at least be reasonably familiar with, with, with the patients he would, he would probably see them every day uh, and at least have, have some idea of how people were progressing. Uh, as the asylum got bigger, he would have to take on assistant doctors. So really, the, I say the whole nature of the system gradually altered and became less and less therapeutic. So whereas in, 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 around the time of the 1845 legislation, there was very great optimism, so-called therapeutic optimism, as to what these asylums were going to achieve, by the end of the 19th century, that optimism had really transformed into a, a quite a considerable pessimism because of the growing numbers of chronic patients, people who just weren't getting better, people accumulating in, in back wards and so on, um, and the apparent ever rising numbers of, of patients. Things became quite pessimistic. There, there was this feeling, oh, we're just never going to be able to to manage this rising tide of insanity. In terms of work, at, at this time, in terms of treatment options, work was regarded 
as the main most effective means of treating insanity. Um, although drugs were still being used, they weren't being used as much in the mid, mid and late 19th century as they were in the previous century. So the use of drugs was rather less, but um, it, treatment was more about the regime. It was about a, an overall regime, an overall environment in which the person was, about, about being away from the strains and stresses of, of being at home, the pressures of work. It, it was about rest, about tranquility, about order, and, um, you know, being well fed, and, and so on. And, and I say particularly work, and work was very much at the centre of things. There was a, a fair amount of work done in, in the grounds, uh, so growing vegetables. Um, I'm not sure if, 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 if Birmingham Asylum had, uh, uh, had, did, had a dairy and so on, but it very probably did, and they would keep cows and sheep and pigs and so on. Um, and operate the farm on a sort of commercial basis. That, that, would, that would be the case in most of the larger asylums. Then there would also be uh, work at trade, such as tailoring, carpentry, uh, shoemaking. You would find most of those things. Uh, baking, uh, brewing, all, all sorts of things. And then the women would, would be doing dressmaking, uh, sewing. Uh, and then people, people of course would be involved in the domestic work, you know, keeping the wards clean, so on, working in the kitchens, the laundry. So asylums at that point operated pretty much as far as possible as, you know, self-supporting communities. And the, the savings from the work carried out by the patients, uh, or even the earnings made from, from selling produce, uh, served to offset the costs of keeping people in the asylum. Most medical advances seem to come about by accidental observations. I mean, like vaccination, uh, it was discovered that uh, milkmaids didn't get smallpox. And that sort of observation leads on to treatment. Uh, during the war, uh, the Japanese army um, overran the, the countries where our supplies of quinine were uh, produced for treating malaria. And so uh, the chemists were set to work in finding a, a substitute for, for quinine and they started off with a, a chemical called phenothiazine and uh, this was used as a, a treatment for worms in, in vet veterinary practice. But in fact they found that uh, with, with chlorpromazine uh, it made people very sleepy. So the, the company decided to market it as a sedative. So it was used on patients who were very excited and uh, calming them down. Better than barbiturates, which were the only ones available before that. And uh, it was then observed that uh, people with schizophrenia were in fact getting better. And uh, it was discovered that these these drugs had an antipsychotic effect as well as a sedative effect. Medication was already substantially used. Drugs like Modicate and Dipixol that were used also um, to treat psychotic illness. And by, by psychotic illness I mean people that were diagnosed with schizophrenia and um, uh, bipolar mood disorder for example. ECT was in common use on all the acute psychiatric units. I remember being involved in insulin coma therapy. I remember taking patients to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for a lobotomy. L lobotomies were performed on site at the hospital, in, at, at Highcroft Hospital in the 50s. And in the old school of nursing, we still had some of the equipment that they used, which uh, was incredibly crude. This was an accidental discovery. It happened uh, as a result of an accident in a quarry where um, a rather unpleasant, aggressive quarryman uh, had a, an iron bar driven through by an explosion through the front of his head. And he didn't uh, die from it. Uh, he, he was a changed man when it, uh, when it got better. So people thought 
It was a way of uh, getting rid of violence and aggression. It did do that, but it also had unfortunate effects on the person's personality. The, the one major change uh, in, in, the, in the sort of late 60s, early 70s was the, the, the development and increasing use of the depot injections. I think that they made a big difference in, in the same way that when, when the antipsychotic like, like Largactyl or Chlorpromazine came, came in, in in the 60, 50s and 60s, I mean they had tremendous effects in, in terms of enabling people to get better who had previously seemed fairly hopeless. Now I know they had their problems, I know that again there they were side effect issues, but nevertheless they enabled a lot of people to lead reasonably normal lives, or lives who, who weren't able to do so before. A psychiatrist whose name I've forgotten uh, in the end of the Victorian era thought that um, patients with epilepsy couldn't develop schizophrenia, thought the two things were mutually exclusive. He thought that if he gave uh, schizophrenic patients epilepsy um, they would get better. And the diagnoses in those days were not incredibly accurate and so some of the so-called schizophrenics were in fact depressives and they improved dramatically on this treatment. It was thought by the Italians that uh, if you could induce fits by electric shocks uh, it would be much more manageable. Experiments were done on pigs in the Rome slaughterhouse. It was found that giving an electric shock to the brain in fact didn't kill the animal and so uh, it was um, safe to induce fits in that way. It's often misunderstood that, uh, that people think it's the electricity which is the treatment, but in fact it's the fit which is the treatment. And uh, if, if people have fits, their depression often gets better. I think anybody can have a mental illness, um, particularly depression and um, anxiety, depending on the sort of stress that they're subjected to. Taking mind-affecting drugs uh, has qu quite a serious effect on the brain and uh, is, has changed the practice of psychiatry, I understand, although I've been retired for a long time now. Uh, the use of drugs is having a, a big effect on uh, causing psychosis, uh, which may have a um, a genetic component. Some people get psychosis more easily than others. You can make people psychotic. Uh, it, this was done in brainwashing, you know, during torture and so on. And you can make people have all sorts of strange ideas by treating them badly enough. I've been in Hutley Mall in my life twice. Uh, when I was 21, I had a brain injection and I went into War 20. I was in War 20 for about two to three weeks the first time. And uh, it was, my, people say about us because, but I've been over here. It was a love to me, the people were lovely there. So they came in, and then from there I got to, into the dark pickle. But then when I was in my uh, early 30s, I had another break down. I ended up back in War 20 for another week. But then I was going back to the hospital for over a year, being picked up by an ambulance on the morning and going there every day for five days a week. And uh, the people was there, it was really lovely to me.